The cross is the place where all the attributes of God converge. God is love, as seen at the cross, as the evidence that God is just in the punishment Jesus bore. Welcome to Jesus Good News TV, stay connected. The Bible defines God as love, yet emphasizes his justice at the cross. Despite Jesus being sinless, he was punished for our sins. In this video you will discover who Jesus really is. Just keep watching. When God set forth Jesus to be a propitiation, a significant term is, hilasterion, meaning a mercy seat. In the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant is referred to as a mercy seat in the Greek version. Jesus is the hilasterion, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark, made of imperious acacia wood, symbolizes incorruptibility. Acacia wood, like cedar, is immune to termites and diseases, representing Jesus' humanity. Wood in the Bible often symbolizes mankind. Jesus, like a tender plant, grew in a morally murky place, ultimately cut off to prepare a mercy seat. Subscribe, like and share for more contents. Jesus, the mercy seat, is made of wood, signifying his humanity. God, in his essence, is incomprehensible to man, but by becoming a man, he becomes understandable. The wood represents mankind, and Jesus being 100% man and 100% God is symbolized by gold both outside and inside the ark. Jesus experienced human emotions without sin, understanding our struggles. Born in a humble setting, he lived among us, choosing poverty initially. Joseph and Mary's offerings of doves reveal their poverty, which changed when the wise men brought valuable gifts later. The wise men visited Jesus about two years after his birth. God instructed Moses to place the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone, inside the Ark of the Covenant. Examining the cross-section of what's inside the Ark, three items are revealed. Firstly, the two tablets of stone, inscribed with the Ten Commandments by the finger of God, are placed inside the Arkansas. The Ark, initially mentioned in Genesis when Joseph was buried in a coffin, A.R., symbolizes perfect holiness. Bringing the tablets of stone out would result in judgment, as everyone falls short of its holiness. Therefore, the tablets are positioned under the mercy seat, where blood is sprinkled annually on the Day of Atonement. Psalm 91 refers to this as the secret place under the wings of the Almighty, with Jesus being our mercy seat. The blood covering prevents God from seeing the rebellion contained in the Ten Commandments. Secondly, Aaron's rod, which budded with white almond flowers, is also placed inside the Arkansas. This rod symbolizes resurrection life from the dead and was chosen through a process involving all twelve tribes. Thirdly, the golden pot of manna is stored in the ark, representing the occasion when manna from heaven was provided to the Israelites after crossing the Red Sea. Jesus later identified himself as the true bread of life, connecting the manna with his own flesh given for the life of the world. The Ark of the Covenant contains these three significant items, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's Rod, and the Golden Pot of Manna, all placed under the cover of the mercy seat, symbolizing the redemptive power of Jesus' blood and his role in overcoming man's rebellion. Every time you partake in communion, remember Jesus' words, the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Reflect on the fact that God never intended for man to die, and aging is essentially a process of dying. However, this process of dying is now reversed through the sacrifice of Jesus. When you take communion, you are partaking in his life. Recall the moment God told Adam and Eve about the consequences of disobedience, the process of dying. Aging is a manifestation of this ongoing process, but the bread of communion symbolizes the reversal of this process. By taking the bread, you are symbolically taking in the life of Jesus, who offered his flesh for the redemption of the world. Consider the response of the Jews when Jesus spoke about giving his flesh to eat. They couldn't comprehend this concept. Thankfully, as believers, we understand the significance of Jesus' sacrifice and can appreciate the depth of his love. Now, let's turn our attention to the cherubim, the guardians in heaven. 
These cherubim, with their eyes representing God's eyes, serve as protectors of God's righteousness and holiness. When Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, the cherubim stood guard, preventing anyone from re-entering. In heaven, these cherubim bear witness to the blood of Jesus on the real mercy seat, speaking better things than the blood of Abel. Their eyes, akin to God's eyes, observe man's rebellion, but the blood covering provided by Jesus prevents judgment. Angels, too, desire to look into the beauty and glory of our salvation. They listen with curiosity and longing as we share the wonders of God's grace and redemption. The cross serves as a visual aid, a reminder of the Son of God's ultimate sacrifice for humanity. So, whenever you contemplate the mysteries of the cross, remember that the real Ark of the Covenant is Jesus himself. One time, I posed a question to the Lord, and it might come as a surprise, even to Bible scholars, during Jesus' time in Jerusalem, the Temple of Herod did not house the Ark of the Covenant. The Holy of Holies was empty because years prior, Solomon, blessed by God with extraordinary wisdom, foresaw the Babylonians' invasion. Aware that they would take away all the temple furnishings, Solomon, knowing the significance of the Ark, hid it. Some speculate it might be in Ethiopia due to Solomon's connection with the Queen of Sheba. However, the real focus should be on the fact that by the time Jesus walked the earth, the temple did not have the Ark. In my quest to discover the Ark's whereabouts, I delved into books and documentaries, only to realize it was a futile pursuit. The real Ark had already come, and I had a revelation during a conversation with the Lord. I asked, Father, isn't it sad that when Jesus was here, the temple did not have the Ark? The Father's response was profound, because he was walking outside, opening the eyes of the blind, unstopping deaf ears, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers. Who needs a visual aid when the substance has come? I emphasize that chasing the location of the Ark is a waste of time because the true Ark is Jesus himself. Kissing a photo is incomparable to kissing the real person, just as understanding the substance is more critical than a visual aid. Now, let's open up the panels on the right and explore the visual aid. Inside the Ark, you find gold within and gold without, an illustration of the cross. Everything God has in mind revolves around Jesus and his finished work. The cross embodies the person and work of Jesus. It's essential to note that Israel, during Moses' time, couldn't comprehend the significance of the cross, as it was a later form of execution. David prophesied about it 3,000 years ago, saying, They pierced my hands and my feet, indicating crucifixion, a messianic psalm pointing to Jesus. The cross is the convergence of all attributes of God, love, justice, light, righteousness, and holiness. It is the place where everything about God meets, and it reveals the depth of his love and the seriousness of sin. On one hand, God is love, but on the other hand, he is also just. The question arises, how can we see all these attributes at once? At the cross, we witness the convergence of God's love and righteousness. While God is just and will not overlook sin, his judgment is carried out in a way that showcases his perfect justice. A just judge is impartial, not swayed by external factors like wealth or status. God, in his justice, does not show favoritism based on circumstances. At the cross, we see God's love and justice harmonizing. Jesus, who knew no sin, took on the punishment for our sins. God's justice demanded judgment, and Jesus willingly bore that judgment on our behalf. At the cross, you witness God's love because it is not you or your children bearing the judgment. Instead, God provided his Son as the Lamb who takes away your sins and bears the punishment. Jesus, cursed and rejected, paved the way for your acceptance and blessing. At the cross, all the claims of divine holiness are fully met, and Christ fulfills the law. We are no longer under the law because Christ fulfilled it on our behalf, and we now live under grace. Reflecting on the camp arrangement of the twelve tribes in the wilderness, you observe a cross-shaped formation, three tribes to the north, west, east, and south has more tribes. From a higher perspective, it resembles a cross. 
Even Prophet Balaam, hired to curse Israel, couldn't curse what God had blessed because when he looked at the encampments of the children of God, he saw a cross perspective. Then he declared in Numbers 23:20, Behold, I have received a command to bless, he has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. God does not behold iniquity in Israel, not because there is none, but because he sees the blood of his son covering it. God bless you.